All right, what's going on? So, yes, I got it right. Yes. All right. So, welcome. Uh, this is going to be a walkthrough of the code that I have on my GitHub repository for the traffic light that you see running back here. Uh, this code is available so that anybody can build their own traffic light if they want to choose. Um, all you really need is a Raspberry Pi. Um, you can get an actual traffic light like I have done, or you can get LEDs um, to connect them up to be able to mimic that. Uh, all of the instructions of what pins to use and so forth are on the GitHub repository. And so the link to that is down in the description. All right, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, so I have the code pulled up here. The I'm going to start, this is a fairly long Python file, but I'm going to actually start where the actual code runs, which is here with the doing the setup of the um, pins and everything else that's necessary for this, and then followed by the uh, while loop. And so the purpose of this while loop is so that the code or the traffic light never shuts down um, once it gets done executing what it executes. Instead, it will call a function, and if the function or program selected to run has changed, then it'll load that new program. Otherwise, it'll continue running the existing program that it has in place. So um, to start from the beginning, we have uh, several files that are being used. And so I'm go up to let me bookmark that point, and we'll go up here to the top, and there are three files that are being used. So there's a traffic file, there's a traffic display, and there's a pseudo file. The traffic file contains the information for the uh, which program to run. The pseudo file is for when you run pseudocode. Um, so basically, it takes the input from here. Um, and puts it into a text file and then the Python script knows what each line is uh, supposed to be. So it's supposed to be one of these options. And so um, based off of that, it knows what to do from that point forward. And so um, Python can read files. Uh, some people may or may not know that. And so what I have it doing is here I have it. So you need to read the traffic file and use that using the uh, read line. There is a uh, include that you'll need up here for the, um, these are all the includes that you need, or so imports if you will. Um, the LCD driver, random for random value sub processes, uh, sub process, GPIO for the Raspberry Pi for controlling the pins on the G uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, random for random numbers and sleep for the time delay. All right, and so with that, uh, we have it reading the input from the traffic file and then closing that file once it's done reading. If the file does not exist, then you'll need to create the file and give it public permissions. And in this particular scenario, um, that is done via the subprocess call. Um, so you're basically running the command, the Linux equivalent of that command to change the permissions. And so to run those actual Linux commands, you do subprocess.call, and then you give it each of the values you want it to run. And so if there is a space in the command that you need to run, so for instance, in this particular command, you would normally run chmod space 0777, and then... Um, temp slash traffic dot txt so since there are spaces here you don't actually code those spaces in instead you separate those as values or in the array here and then that goes um, like so because if you put spaces here it handles those pretty awkwardly so um, that's why you don't do it that way all right and then the next thing is we have a text display file um, that is to show things on the LCD that I have attached. Um, that is not, I do not believe this is actively used right now since I don't have the LCD connected. Um, but at some point in the future, I will have it connected and we'll be using this set of functionality. All right, the next part is the pseudocode file. So when I type items in the 
text box here. So if I type red and green, um, and then hit submit on this form here that will write to this text file and if I change the option to use or uh, change the program to use pseudocode it will follow those instructions reading line by line to determine what to do and we'll get a little bit more into that a little bit later and likewise if there is an exception um, if the file does not exist or it can't write to the file system then creating the file um, using the similar process for the traffic file up here. So create it, change the permissions to public, and then close it. All right, going further down, here we have uh, if condition in Python. And so uh, basically we're checking the display state to see if it's on or off. Um, this is a hard-coded value. This is not a value being passed in. And so if the value is set to on, then we'll also display that information to the LCD, but this value is set to off until I get the LCD running. So the display value will default to an empty string. All right, the next is the uh, checking what program to run. And so um, from up here, so we're actually reading the file and we're putting that into uh, the contents of that file into a variable. So if we switch over to the terminal where I actually have it uh, currently running right now and do a view of traffic, uh, do more of traffic.txt, you'll see the, uh, the contents of this file contains the US traffic flasher. Um, and so if you go to, so basically if the selection contains the word traffic, um, I've written a function because the traffic signal uh, function is pretty similar um, for different countries and different flows. Uh, so I just use one function and it just put a bunch of if conditions in there uh, for the changing, you know, how we do things. So um, this if condition, uh, if satisfied, will go to the run signal function and it will pass the selection, which is the value that it read in, in as an argument. So if we go to the run signal function, all right, let's, run signal. All right, here we go. All right, so how we're using this is we're, so there is a function declared of run signal and it's expecting the value of country um, and so what I have is a phase flasher so basically this is a variable to track whether if it's doing the flashing like you may have seen for the yellow and red lights uh, if it does a flash it tracks whether that light is on or off using a number value um, and that number value changes depending upon the light and so We'll cover that a little bit more because that's another function. The flashing functionality is another function. All right, and so what I have it doing is using the random import to generate a random time for each of the colors. So it's a random green time, which is here. You have a random yellow time, which is here, and then a random red time. And so these values can change. Um, so basically, the red and green are at a minimum will stay green for five seconds at a maximum will stay green for 45 seconds uh, the yellow here this two and five represents a minimum of two seconds and a maximum of five seconds and then the red is the same as the green five and 45 this can be changed to something else but that's what i have it set at for right now and so it's generating these values before it actually goes and starts to do a what I refer to as a cycle of the signal. And so a cycle is basically a red, yellow, green um, cycle. And then once it goes back to green again, that's a brand new cycle. And so each time it starts a new cycle, it, re it re uh, generates new random numbers and then it follows those numbers. And so what we have here is another function. Um, and this is basically how I am using uh, how I'm controlling each light. And so I have a function that basically says what state that light should be in. Um, and, each, and by light, I mean the individual colors that's represented. Um, and so 
we'll jump to this function right quick. And so uh, in simplicity's sake, I have red, yellow, green for each of these, and you pass them in as values. And this is where we actually control the GPIO pins. Um, so the GPIO pins in the setup function have been defined as outputs. And so in Python, you either have an input or an output. Uh, I mean, excuse me, with the Raspberry Pi, you either have an input or an output. An input is basically listening for a electrical signal. Output is producing an electrical signal. And so this output is, uh, for every time this function is called, it's either change, it's setting the value for that particular pin. And so I have the uh, pin numbers set as constants up here at the top. Where are we at? Right here. All right, so each of the GPI pin numbers uh, has a pin number. And I, I defined that there, there's no real way of doing constants in Python, but normally when you have a constant in any programming language, that constant is always written in the var that constant variable is always written with uppercase letters. So uh, by be writing this in uppercase letters, I know that it is a constant. And then uh, some additional constants that I would find. So once we go back down, I'll show you further. So the lamp on corresponds to the GPIO low constant, um, and lamp off corresponds to GPIO high. Now, why is on low and off high? And it has to do with the wiring of the Raspberry Pi. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it is wired in a way that when you say low, that it automatically uh, connects the circuit through. And when you say high, it connects the circuit to ground, thus not sending the output out. And so that's why it's defined that way. So for to keep it simple, I said, instead of trying to remember which way is which, I say, let me just create a constant um, and say on is on, obviously, and off is off. And that way I don't have to remember what this high and low means. Um, so anytime you're building something, uh, whether it's in Python or not, it's easier to create a uh, variable that makes it easier to remember certain things like that instead of trying to remember the actual how whoever authored the uh, library or import or whatever the case may be package um, used it. Instead, just create your own constant that maps to that so much easier. All right, and then I also have another constant for the flasher delay. So basically, when you see it blinking, it is a, it'll blink on for 0.7 seconds, and it'll blink off for 0.7 seconds. Um, I tried one second, and it seemed like it was dragging out a little bit too long, so I, that's where I got the 0.7 seconds from. Um, and then there's some other constants here for the... Uh, for the file names. Okay, so and also the pinouts um, is the same thing here as these constants. Um, I may actually go and change this at some point so that this pinout list refers to these constants instead of having the same pin numbers in here more than once. All right, so going back to, I believe we were on run signal. Uh, all right, so I have a, um, this is how you do a for loop in Python. So basically you give it a for value and you give it a uh, variable name, which is an integer. And in this case, I'm using a range. And so uh, the random green time that is calculated from up here on line 133. So the random green time is passed in and then you wanna start from that random green time till you get to zero. And each time you go through this loop, you want to count down by negative one. And so what that will do is on the LCD screen um, that I have, it will update this time remain. So if we go back to the console, um, I actually think I do have this, yes. All right, so let me stop it and start it back again. All right, and so this is what it would be outputting to the console. Um, so you have a green signal with the time remaining. And so that corresponds to this green signal uh, message rather, and the time remaining. And it's taking the integer time and you have to convert it to a string. 
Um, some languages will allow you to take the integer and just drop it directly into a string. This one actually you have to convert the integer to a string and then use it in the string because uh, Python will not explicitly just convert integers to string unless you tell it to. Um, so that's why I have the integer value here and then the str um, says to convert the object to a string. All right, and so there's that. In Russia, there's a slightly different variant. So they actually have a flashing green, come to find out. So I coded it so that if the country uh, value that's being passed in here uh, starts with Russia, then you're going to do a flasher green for between five and 10 seconds until you get to zero and it'll flash on off on off um, and then once it does that, then it will go to the yellow. Um, and so again, we're calling that function that describes how to do yellow uh, from you basically giving it what needs to be on and what needs to be off and the function does everything else. And then we're doing the same thing for this for loop. This time you're just taking a different variable, uh, the random yellow time. And then we're doing the same thing for the red and in the UK, so they have a slightly different setup. So in America, normally it's green, yellow, red, and then green again. In the UK, it's green, yellow, red, and then there's a red, yellow combined, and then there is green. Um, so for that, it is actually doing something slightly different to accommodate that. Um, so it's had a separate phase here, and as you see, it mentions red, yellow, and we're still doing the same thing as above. Now the flasher is slightly different. Um, so what you're doing is picking a random color. Uh, so basically anything below five will be red. Anything above that will be yellow. And then you're doing the picking a random integer between six and 30. So this would be between six and 30 flashes. Um, and that's flashing on and off. And then you're doing the run flasher, which, uh, here is tracking um, the value. So um, remember that phase flasher uh, variable that you had before. So this is where that comes into play. So if the value is one, you change the setting uh, or you change the light to off and then you set the value to two so that the next time it comes back around, it knows that, hey, the last time I went through here, it was one, now I'm changing it to two and then if it's not one, then you change it back to two. Um, so this is how it knows how to function between the two colors, um, or the corresponding colors rather. And so each light has the ability to be able to flash, um, and there's also ability to be able to flash all of the lights. I don't think I actually have this implemented in here in any kind of way though, but that ability does exist. All right, and then in Python, you can do a sleep. Um, so basically you give it, uh, you call the sleep function. Again, you have to have the import, which is defined up here at the top. Uh, where is it, right here, from the time. And then you give it a value. And so from that value, it will pause whatever it's doing. So like here, have it sleeping for three seconds. Um, and this is in seconds, not minutes. Um, I know in some languages, you, when you call the sleep, is in milliseconds, for instance, Java is that way. So in Java, this would be 3000 instead of three, but in Python, it defaults to seconds, not milliseconds. All right, and so that covers that particular part. Um, let's go further down a little bit. Where is, oh, I think I passed it, okay. And so the rest of these are defined as some kind of function call that does something. And so if you, uh, it's kind of difficult to see, but if you go on GitHub to this uh, repository, you notice I defined all of my functions at the top. Um, so here is, so here are my constant variables. My, you do your imports, you do your variables that are global. You know, this is kind of how I design mine. And then your non -glo your global variables that are not necessarily constants are grouped together. And then you do your functions. And then at the bottom, you actually have your running logic, which starts with this try here. Well, excuse me, it starts with the setup, um, the debug, and then the try, and everything underneath the try. 
And the reason you do this this way is because um, you don't want your functions. Uh, is ideally you have your functions up above, and then um, and that way they're all grouped together, and then your running logic would be down at the bottom. Um, that way you know, hey, everything above is already declared and defined. Uh, that way you just you don't have to worry about well, did I declare this already or not? You already know that is there. <clears throat> all right. And so going a little bit further down, uh, so if you want to do if conditions, uh, basically you just you can do it this way, um, which is the variable name equal to and then what you're looking for. And so if so for in this particular situation, if selection equals all underscore on, then this will return true. If you're doing wild cards in your variables, you'll do them like this. So you have the whatever the partial string that you're looking for and that's in and then the variable name and then your if conditions unlike some languages they uh, contain the if conditions either in brackets or parentheses Python does not do that instead you just put if whatever your condition is with a colon at the end of it um, I'm not sure if I have one I think I might have one in here that has a ampersand let's see no, I don't have one in here. What about, okay. So in Python, if you have a, uh, you can do multiple conditions within the same statement. Um, to join those, you'll do double ampersand or the double pipe character to be able to get that logic to work. Um, the rest of them here, so what else we have here? So we have a four. So this is the part in Python where it has, uh, it reads the file and it puts the entire contents into that file. And so if you're reading the file or writing to the file, you need to open it accordingly. So this open function, as you see here, um, you define the file type and then you define the mode. Uh, the mode, it will vary. So I'm doing a reading. Uh, yeah, so I'm doing a reading of the file using the R. I can't recall off the top of my head what the B stands for, but R stands for reading. And if we go up to the top up here, I have a, um, nope, not that far, three, here we go. So this one is just doing a read, and when you open the file this time, it opens right. And so the reason that you have to specify the operation that you intend on doing is because uh, Python will lock that file. So if you're trying to actually write to that file, it will lock it so no other process can write to it. Um, because if you're writing to it and then something else is writing to it, that can corrupt the file because um, you might be trying to write to the same thing and it does not know what goes where and so that can cause problems. So that's why you need to specify whether you're uh, reading or writing to the file. Uh, hello Felipe from Portugal. Nice for you to join. All right, so the next part of this, um, yeah, so here's where you're reading each line of the file. And so um, if you only have one line in the file, it will only read that one line, obviously. But if you have multiple lines, this is the easy way of trying to, uh, let's say you're trying to convert a uh, CSV file over to some other format and you need to read each line. So you can get that line by doing it like this. And then once you're done with your, uh, file that you're reading, be sure to close it. And that's what I'm doing down here at the bottom. Um, this other stuff here is stuff we've already covered as far as if conditions, how to check for certain conditions and so forth. And then also doing function calls. And so um, won't cover that again. Um, and we also have some exceptions. So this is how you kind of do exceptions in Python. Um, so if I go back to my terminal, and hit control C. And so what it does is I coded this in a way, so here's the exiting with exception, um, because control C in Linux terminates the program. And so what was happening is, um, when I, as I was building this out, uh, the light, when you would kill the program, it would stop wherever it was. So if the red light was on and you killed it, the red light would stay on even after program exited. And so what I had to do was to catch, um, figure out how to do that. And so what I found out was that the 
um, the 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 kill command, which is Control C, will throw cause the Python script or Python in general to throw an exception, and you can catch that exception and then do some action after that exception is thrown. And so what I've done is so as you see here, exiting with exception and then all lights off. So the exiting with exception comes from this. Um, if there was another exception here, um, sometimes like you make an exception with the GPIO pins. Uh, so I've had that occur where it exited with the exception, but then it threw a message from the GPIO pin could not be released or something of that nature, uh, which is not a critical thing, but it's something of importance at least. And then the all off is this last line in here. Um, and so as you see, I killed this and all the lights are now off which is what you would expect when you're exiting a program. You wouldn't expect it to still be lit up or anything of that nature. Um, and so at one point I did have to do a cleaning of the GPIO pins, but I refactored the code in a way that does not mandate that that be done now. So that function is commented out, but still there in case I need it in the future. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and start the light back up. And Let's see what other items in here that need to be covered. Um, as you see, we've covered functions pretty well. There are a number of functions in here that um, you can see how to do them. Some have no arguments passed in, like this one. So you just do open and close parentheses. Some have several arguments. Uh, so like this one has one argument. So you just do that with the argument in and then close it off. And where's one? So this one has multiple and you separate each one with a comma. Um, there was one in here with a default value. Let's cover that. Where'd it go, where'd it go? It's in the log. Here we go. All right, so you can call a function in Python and have one of those arguments that are passed into that function with a default value. And so to do that, you do it like this. Um, Normally you put the default, the items with the default values at the end of the call. Um, that way you know the order of those. So when you type it in, so let's say for instance, if I had a default value as the first one, that means I don't have to specify it. But if it's the first one and I don't specify it, then when I actually do type my function call in there, I run into a problem. So let's say, uh, for example, Let's say we did a uh, LCD message and my first value was uh, test and second value was line. Well, you know, based upon this definition that test corresponds to line one and line corresponds to line two. No question about it. But let's say I had a default value of 23 here. And so uh, we'll take this first value out. Now, you're calling this function using the function name, but you don't, if you have your, uh, an argument here, does this go, well, let me change this to something else. All right, that looks a little bit better. All right, so you have your function here, and you're passing an argument in, but you don't know if this argument goes with line one or line two. Why not? Because line one is defined as having a default value. So you don't know where it goes. And so as a result, you know, it's a bad practice to have your default values first and then your required value second. So that's why I have it coded this way um, with the required values first, default value second. Um, all right, so let me take that back out. All right, and uh, so normally I don't do coding in Visual Studio Code. That's why it keeps prompting me for that particular message. Um, normally when I'm doing any coding for this traffic light here, it is directly on the traffic light. Um, most of the time I'm able to get it there. Worst case scenario, I'll just type it out and debug it as I go. Um, all right, so you can also have return values in your function. And if you notice, some functions don't have return values. So like this run red light, green light does not have a return down here at the end. And so, and that's simply because it does not return a value. Um, these don't return values either, but I think when I initially built this out, 
I put return zero out of habit in there. Um, at some point, I'll probably go back through here and refactor this and remove those since uh, not all functions do return values. Some of the functions, though, such as the, um, I think it's called phase, no, let's see, phase, run flasher, that's what it's called. All right, so the run flasher actually does return a legit value um, in this right here. So um, basically, you're taking in a value of phase, and then at the end of whatever that phase is, it's setting a value, and then it's returning that value back. And the reason being is because um, you want to be able to track the value so you know whether to flash on or off in there. All right, so... Um, that is return values and the same thing here for the next phase um, so I have a what I refer to as a party mode and so um, you pick a phase that's in here um, from this list and uh, ideally it should not pick the same phase twice but it sometimes it does do the same phase twice in a row and so uh, once that's done if it is in party mode it will pick a different phase every time it goes through and um, you want that phase to stay on for a certain amount of time so you again using the sleep function with the provided delay and in this scenario delay changes based upon how fast the party mode is set and then here we are again using return values for uh, tracking that all the way through and outside of the function um, let's see what other items here so also you want to use print so the print function in python is very essential uh, a lot of times you're using that for debugging of some sort or even just seeing what's going on within the application and so i'm using it currently to for the console window here so it's also printing to this here to be able to so i can see it on the console uh, but it's also a use case for me having it on the lcd which is this right here um, so but the print one here is printing out so if you ever have any errors or anything of that nature uh, you'll want those to print out to the terminal window because most likely you'll be in your initial uh, building of Python uh, applications or tools you'll be building them in the terminal to start out and so uh, the easy way that I've done this is to be able to create a function that calls message uh, I mean excuse me that accepts a value of message and then that prints instead of having print you know a lot of times in my code uh, I more so do this with um, items that are kind of like shell scripts or Python scripts um, and that way let's say at some point I want to put the date in here with this I can just easily go here at the command for date and then I have date and the message um, instead of having to change that in multiple places all right and let's see what other items here um, so there is a way that you can call functions in another, uh, I guess, import. And so you just do that import name dot whatever that function is. Um, if you don't know this off the top of your head, you'll probably just have to look it up. There's a lot of resources online on how to call these uh, methods within Python. So um, I don't expect you to know all of this. I don't even know some of this. A lot of times I spend, you know, a decent amount of time researching how to do this as I learned how to program uh, before Python was a major language um, so building this you know it took a lot of time to build it uh, but now that I have it working you know I'm glad that I do to be able to share it with you all all right um, let's see I believe that covers pretty much the basics of Python and how I was able to build that out oh I do see this here so you can do less than greater than within your if conditions as well um, this is just an example. So instead of a double equals, you do less than or greater than operator or less than, uh, you can do less than equal to, greater than equal to as well. And so um, I'm trying to see if there are any other items here. Oh, yeah. So we can also do math. And so, um, so if you're not aware, yellow lights have, are the, the amount of time that the light stays yellow is based upon the speed limit of the road that it's on and so um, what I built out was this function here called calculate yellow time 
And based upon that, if it picks a random number between 25 and 80. Theoretically, this is in miles per hour. So for those of you watching in other countries, um, you would need to probably change this to kilometers per hour, whatever that is. I'm not fully sure. Um, but 25 miles between 25 miles an hour and 80 miles an hour. And then you take that speed and you put it into your function here. And so as you see, it's doing a lot of math here. You got multiplication, which is represented by this asterisk. You have addition, which is represented by the plus sign. You have, there's no subtraction here, but subtraction is in Python is represented by the minus sign. And then division is represented by the slash. And then um, you also have parentheses, like you have parentheses in, um, in math to group things together or to group expressions together. Uh, same thing here. And so if you want to look up this function, uh, you can just look up the, the yellow, yellow light time function um, and it'll tell you what this really is in the non-computerized version uh, with the you know writing over top and so forth. Um, and then once that was done, then it will return a yellow time uh, back, which is in this case would be a decimal. And notice that I'm not having to convert anything from integer to decimal. Python automatically does that. A lot of languages, when you define the integer, you have to set it as a decimal. Otherwise, you get a uh, typecast exception of or something similar of that nature. Um, and one other thing that you may not notice that also happens in Python is there is no strict typing or uh, variable type defined of each of the variables. So I can just write a variable name here. Uh, or anywhere in this code and it will automatically figure out based upon what's there what kind of variable it is so as you see here speed is not defined anywhere else but uh, it will know that speed is an integer based upon the return value of rand it and so um, that's one what that's a helpful thing and it also knows that uh, yellow time could be an integer or it could also be a float let's see if we do that again yeah, so it could be an integer or it could be a float based upon how this computation works out. Um, in most scenarios, it will probably be a float. I don't know, um, especially with all these decimal places here. Um, in there, it's more than likely going to be a float instead of an integer. And what a float means is a floating point number and or uh, something with a decimal in it. All right. Um, all right, so that particularly covers this uh, walkthrough of Python and how I built out this traffic light. Um, this was really my first uh, building this controller for the traffic light was really my first exposure to learning Python. Um, it did take a while for me to master it and whatnot and kind of understand the concepts uh, because I built a lot of applications that uh, like C sharp based Java based uh, PHP base which do require semicolons on every line um, the indentations are not that critical and so forth and then also having to write learn how to write if conditions differently and so forth um, so there was a slight bit of learning curve here a lot of people say that Python is easier to learn if you've never learned it before um, it took me a while to learn it and I, again I guess because of the fact that I'm not you know, I learned other languages before I learned Python. Um, so the syntax definitely is one thing that got me uh, kind of messed up a little bit in there. But overall, you know, I'm comfortable with it now. Um, I probably can't do like a lot of the data analysts, analytics like some people can, you know, they can put this, they can write Python scripts out. They'll do all kinds of computations and spit out graphs and stuff like that. I'm not at that level, as you can see, this is just simple creating a controller that can do things. Um, I'm looking to possibly do maybe a little bit more with this uh, in the future, but this is you know just the basics now, and um, hopefully you've been able to get a little bit out of this when it comes to Python. Um, if you have any questions, you can leave those down in the comment section below, or you can also hit me up on Instagram and Twitter at almost ENGR with your questions. So. That will conclude it for this live stream. The next live stream will be on May 17th. And so I'll be discussing databases then. Um, so if you wanna learn databases, feel free to come back in um, the event. If you wanna sign up for that, 
uh, you, you can set a reminder by going to my channel and on, at the top of there, or close to the top, there's a uh, thing that says the, the live streams, upcoming live streams, and you can set a reminder by using that. So until next time, peace out. Again, feel free to reach out if you have any questions.